Shaweb, CEO and co-founder of Esper. Thanks very much for coming on the Geospatial Index. Thanks a lot for having me. So let's launch straight in. Pardon the pun. Uh, what's the elevator pitch for Esper? Yeah, so our Esper satellite imagery, we are building and launching hyperspectral satellites. Uh, more specifically, we build hyperspectral payloads, put them on satellites, then sell the imagery from these payloads. Uh, we primarily work in the resources sector, so we have customers in mining and oil and gas primarily, but then we're also doing a lot of work across agriculture, forestry, and a few other industries as well. Okay, so it sounds like you might have ticked off the next question, which is what niche do you dominate? Could you give us a bit more commentary there, though? Yeah, for sure. As mentioned, right, we're doing quite a lot of work in the resources sector. And a few, a little bit of that, and the reason how we ended up in that is a bit twofold from a more technology perspective, as well as what we saw in the market. Um, so first things first, obviously, we're Australian, we're an Australian company. Um, so when it comes to earth observation, we're very much working pretty closely with land surveyors and geologists here in the country, which has a very big overlap with the mining industry here, which is again, you know, one of Australia's biggest imports, uh, exports, sorry. Um, and that's one of the reasons how we actually got drawn ourselves as a company into the industry itself, where we saw the uh, the problem sets that a lot of these mining customers were facing, where you know you have you drill thousands of holes and maybe only a handful of those will actually yield to any productive results uh, from a mineral exploration point of view. Um, and that was the problem set that we're that we're actually looking to solve with our imagery. Um, where, you know, with the hyperspectral imagery, it's a very killer use case when it comes to resources, exploration and management, uh, whether it be when you're looking for new minerals, being able to identify ores, different clay deposits, different uh, geological features that can lead to certain ores and being able to do that at a click of a button is just very cost effective for a lot of our customers, especially when, you know, each single drill hole can be a few hundred thousand dollars. Whereas, you know, a single tile of our image can be maybe a few hundred dollars uh, instead of a few hundred thousand, right? Uh, so that's uh, something where we're really trying to bring in that 100x uh, efficiency improvement. And that's how we're, we found ourselves, uh, you know, working pretty closely with the resources sector. Gee, that's a really nice contrast you've put there. And I should also say you're one of my most efficient guests so far. That's the, another question for the one that you've already started to address. Okay. Uh, let's get some more detail on customer need uh, definition um, after this question. So what is the skin in the game of the owner slash management slash staff? We're looking at incentives here and alignment. Yeah, so we uh, make sure that all of our staff has, including obviously as founders, we have equity in the company, right? Like that's sort of the biggest payout uh, that we're expecting. It's like, you know, we obviously we want to grow the business to be something fairly large and have a good event in the company where we can, you know, all get rich and, you know, make impact all along the way, right? Um, and for the staff, we in so advise everybody similarly. Like we have uh, from the get go, I and my co-founder Joey, we've been very forward looking when it comes to you know stock incentives and stock equity. We're like, hey, we're a startup. We know we don't have that much money that we can spend on a lot of great people, but the any other ways we can incentivize folks, especially being stock, is. Uh, something that we're really pushing forward to, um, especially with like stock being fairly rare, stock options at least being fairly rare in Australia. Uh, obviously, in startups is coming up, but it's been rare in the sense that you know we haven't had a company like Apple or you know some huge ones. Maybe Canva might be an exception here, uh, where you know uh, people have become millionaires off of stock options. But hopefully, we see that change and uh, people realize what the value of that is. But beyond that as well, right? We our company has a fairly noble mission, or at least I like to tell myself that. Where sure we're working with a lot of these industries that are in a way exploiting the earth, but we're making them a lot more sustainable. Where that exploitation is actually beneficial to obviously humankind, but then also uh, doing that in a manner where we're actually making a lot of more positive impact uh, on the planet, uh, essentially while also furthering uh, you know humanity. That's obviously a little bit, uh, you know, very uh, abstract and a very big picture way of talking, but that's how we sort of work with our team and that's how we communicate to them. It's, you know, this is what we're uh, sort of working towards. I, I love it. The The message to me is that nature has a, has skin in the game in all that we do. Um, and you've just recognized that. And I guess a way to put it in, in numerical terms is perhaps there are fewer geotech boreholes that are drilled um, as a result of paying for your mm -hmm. much cheaper imagery tiles. That's exactly it, right? 
uh, where uh, not only is that more beneficial to our customer, where they're actually spending less money, but is it more? Uh, but it is a lot more, uh, you know, uh, less expensive on the ecology or the environment of the areas where our customers are operating. Um, and so where we see ourselves basically, you know, hitting two birds with one stone where, you know, we're having a more positive environmental impact in the operation of our customer. Uh, we're all while we're also driving up margins where, you know, helping, uh, you know, find better uh, mineral resources on the planet. That is, again, you know, further great for our customers, but also great for just people in general. Right? Like if uh, we have more minerals, that actually leads us for more production of everything from batteries, you know, helping us move towards electrification uh, that then, you know, further has impacts on a lot of different, uh, uh, you know, aspects of life. Yeah. OK. Yeah. I, I have a bad habit on the show of linking the current guests to other ones. And I don't want to turn this into, you know, a big, um, I don't want to distract from the conversation, but I can't help but thinking map impact where we had their chief scientist now Nina Moiseva on could be used to verify that one of your clients is in fact having less of an impact on nature. Um, because yeah, they have a, a nature sort of metrics, um, service using imagery data so yeah okay um yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. Cool. the is sort of just sort of add on to that point as well something that we've been uh doing at esper is also we're integrating a lot of other different data sets and working with a lot of other folks who are using not just our imagery um so uh we're we're always sort of like looking at synergies and that maybe uh, you know this is me pointing a little bit towards our partnership with wyvern where you know uh in some uh, life. Some people would have thought of us as competitors, but now we're actually working together and, you know, using their imagery. They're looking to use our imagery uh, and we're uh, basically like sort of carving out a path in the market where, you know, it's not a winner takes all. It's basically we can be winners only if all of us are winners. And I think that's something that we're starting to realize. Cool. Oh, yeah, I, I did see some uh, chatter uh, between you and Chris, um, who is another has been another guest on, on the show. Um, yeah, so I look forward to finding out a bit more about that um, later on. Okay, then um, I think you've already begun to to discuss this, but just to cover it off, who's your ideal customer and how do you always ensure that you're working backwards from their needs? Yeah, so, you know, of course, we've been talking about resources a lot. Um, the spec at least, so this is mean going a little bit more technical, but the spec for a lot of our uh, imager products uh, then consequently at the satellites and the payloads that we're building is always driven by customer demand. Uh, we're not going to be adding any extra bands. We're not going to be going for a specific resolution or we're not going to be going for a specific spectrum unless we know that there's a customer need for that and we've proven that beforehand. Um, that's why it's like obviously us working very closely with mining that's driving a lot of the specifications of our imagery, not just that, but just the economics of the imagery as well. So obviously being a mining customers, they're looking at entire continents. They're looking at very big chunks of land when they're exploring and when they find something, it's a lot more focused. It's a lot more higher revisits, a lot more looking at, you know, something specific at a higher, uh, uh refresh rate or at a higher resolution. Um, so that's very much that's draw, uh, that's been. Uh, driving a lot of our technical progresses as well. We're now with our upcoming satellites, we are basically looking to have a lot of higher resolution shortwave infrared capability. And that's the capability that we've seen that currently lacks in the market, at least at a very economical price point. Um, you can get that IR imagery, but you're paying you know, $40 per square kilometer USD. Um, and if you're looking at, let's say, the entirety of Australia to do like an entire exploration survey, that is a lot of money. That's right. 40 so times 7 million. <laughs> exactly, right? Um, that's a lot of money, especially if there's a refresh rate, uh, a lot revisit right. rate along with that as well. Um, so what we're really looking to do is like reducing that price of that imagery while not compensating on the actual uh, spectrum or what can be derived from that spectrum. Obviously, we'll have there is a trade off, right? Like if we're making, let's say, our payloads to be cheaper, we are. Um, sort of losing out on some bands or losing out some fidelity in certain bands, but we're really much, very much tuning to what the customer will actually be intending to use. So even if we're, let's say we don't have, you know, some band that's great, the rest of the bands are still uh, uh, very well operating. But so far with our sensors, we've noticed that we are very high performing uh, across all bands. Our spatial resolution is somewhere around medium uh, at the moment. So we're about 10 to 30 uh, when it comes to visual to sphere uh, within that. But that we've seen for a uh, lot of exploration sorry, I, just, customers. 
I just want to pick you up. You said visual to swear. What's the definition of these terms? Yeah, uh, so from the visual spectrum to the shortwave infrared uh, spectrum. Gotcha. Um, so we're basically uh, the current sensors that we're building are capturing from 400 nanometers to about 1700 nanometers. Yeah. Um, and that's where a lot of our you know, mining customers and even some oil and gas customers are interested in looking at those spectrums uh, uh, at the resolutions that we're looking to offer them. Cool. OK, um, I guess you know, I, I've had some of my career in Australia, um, I should say, and to sort of back up your comments about Australia being a big place um, and the consequences for oil or you know, general resource extraction and exploration companies. I used to work at uh, Central Petroleum and the exploration tenements they had were basically the size of Japan. Um, and at the time, there was only one producing oil well. Um, that they had that was giving about 100 barrels a day. Um, so that's a small company, but just an example um, of, yeah, the, the contrast between the area being explored and actually what they'd managed to find to, to extract. Okay, uh, so how fast and sticky is growth? Yeah, it's, we, I think just uh, there's an article on payload that went out in last week or the week before where it's sort of showing a lot of our revenue growth. Um, so in regard, even with our first satellite not working out so well, we've been able to manage to get a second one uh, in the or in orbit that's operating right now. And with that, we're actually growing fairly quickly. Um, basically, over the last uh, 12 months, we've seen 100x growth, and I'm not exaggerating on that number. Uh, we've, uh, from what we had bookings, basically this time last year, we've 100x that. Um, and that's, of course, multi yield contracts going into you know, our flagships that we're looking to launch in 2026. Um, but yeah, from what we've been able to prove as a company, and for uh, we've been extremely lean while we've, while we've been able to do that as well. We basically, uh, by January, we'll have three satellites in orbit uh, with only less than a million dollars spent uh, in R&D as a company total. Um, and those economics are just really hard to beat. And that's how we're able to actually get a lot more customers because they see what we're doing with uh, so little capital and the fact that we can actually deliver really high quality data for, you know, a dollar, dollar fifty per square kilometer. That is very attractive to our customers, and that's how they're, uh, you know, they love working with us. This is insane. So, how big is? Are they cubesats? Can you hold them in your hand? If it's only a million on R and D, give us a, an impression of um, what that results in physically. For sure. So we, our first demonstration imagers have been cubesat spec. Um, so they have been much smaller, mainly because we're trying to get, you know, uh, we're trying to provide a lot of the tenets of our own imagery and just the way we design and build our imagers um, for those demonstration missions. So there is, there are obviously not the highest end that we could be building. We're in the process building those for our flagships that we're looking to fly in uh, about a year and a half. Um, but yeah, for the demos, they were a lot more smaller, um, but they're still good imagery uh, where, you know, now there's three of them, hopefully by, uh, you know, by January, that's the current launch date that we're looking at for our third mission. Um, so yeah, it's uh, for, you know, we're one of maybe two startups that have pulled off, you know, getting stuff into orbit for a pre-seed. Um, so yeah, we're, we're pretty proud of that. I love it. You're not a vaporware company. Um, you're actually yeah, converting the funding you've received into yeah, actual capability. Excellent. Um, so you mentioned something to do with your first launch. Could you give us some details? Sure. So our first launch didn't go as well as we had planned. Um, and uh, so to give some context there, uh, we built our first payload, which uh, was the, we call it the Espresso. Um, it was for our it. demonstration. Thanks. It's <laughs> a great uh, name. It was it was for our demonstration missions, which we titled Over the Rainbow um, and OTR for short. And this one was supposed to be OTR one. Uh, we launched with a hosted payload provider uh, where we were one of about six or seven payloads on that spacecraft. Um, but unfortunately, that spacecraft uh, did not end up working out because it was also a demonstration spacecraft. Um, so we are very, still very honored from uh, from the partner that we actually worked with that we actually got a very low cost ride into space. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, unfortunately we had we lost that spacecraft while it was up there. And OTRX, which is our second mission, which was us basically buying uh, you know timeshare on a spacecraft that was similar enough to ours. Um, that's the one that we're currently operating and serving a lot of that imagery to our customers right now. Um, now there's a third mission, OTR2, uh, which is currently slotted. That's 
fully our hardware. We basically had an entire satellite bus commissioned for us. Um, so that's looking to be launching in January of 2025. Okay, this is this is really. I wanted to have you on the show to sort of give a feel for you know um, what can happen with these launches, and sometimes they end in disaster, and that's just part of it. Um, and it's a story in some ways of resilience, or you know, if you're a young company, you need to have a way to sort of bounce back. Um, so exactly, yeah, it's, it's space is probably one of the most unforgiving industries, right? Uh, there, we see a lot of uh, like newer companies coming in, and uh, there's so much more, uh, you know, hype around very, you know, like technologies that we wouldn't have even thought of, uh, right? In space, and it's just uh, like uh, it humbles. It humbled us a lot, uh, right? It's like I remember when we started the company three, four years ago, and we were still in college. Uh, like we were like so excited we were, we were going to be like oh in six months we're going to launch this satellite they're going to have more and we're like by the time we're here uh, we're uh, we've definitely grown a lot wiser um, but yeah it's it has not been easy and in a way I think it's uh, when you have a lot of mission critical applications right from your customers and like and you have the, as large of an impact as you can that Earth observation can on you know just again humankind right like uh, it's just to think about in that scale, in a way, it's good that uh, it the industry hardens you up because uh, that is the scale and that it's the stakes that you're playing at. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, overall, it's been a pretty net positive for us. Yeah. What was the launch company out of interest? Uh, we worked with uh, Space Machines Company. Uh, great guys. They're based out of okay. Sydney. Um, they are, I think, working also on Australian. another mission. They're also Australian, so very much an Australian mission. Um, so yeah, they're working on another mission, and uh, we're pretty excited to see their second satellite go up soon as well. Um, so yeah, uh, they're they're a great company and with a with a great mission that uh, is more extra uh, terrestrial than ours because uh, we're more at the station and they're you know OTVs uh, looking at you know more interplanetary exploration. So uh, they're they're a really cool company. Oh, does this relate to like asteroid mining and, and exploration? Similar ish. So uh, they build OTVs, so orbit transfer vehicles, which is literally like in orbit servicing. Um, oh, but wow. you know the yeah. same platforms are yeah the same platforms are kind of or at least what we're seeing in the industry as a general is very much building out towards you know extraterrestrial exploration and excavation eventually as well. So who knows? Maybe one of our uh, payloads may eventually find itself on a satellite that's actually going to go and do some surveillance on some asteroid to find. Uh, you know, mineral savvy may want to wine, but uh, I think that's at least years away at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Wow, it's, it's nice for the insight on all the infrastructure and sort of logistics related stuff um, that's also going up into space. Okay, so what can OTRX do for customers and is it using Wyvern somehow? Uh, not really. Um, we so Wyvern is one of our partners, and we Wyvern's not our only data partner. Uh, we currently work with Array Labs as well. And what we're essentially looking to do at Esper is not just be uh, like it just only a hyperspectral company. We have what we have seen is that you know our customers can derive a lot more value if a hyperspectral is just not the only data set that they're getting. Um, that's where you know Wyvern has great high-res optical, uh, also uh, hyperspectral imagery that you know very well complements our medium resolution uh, stuff. Uh, Array is working on a lot of 3D imagery uh, using their radar constellation, and there's a few other folks that we're looking to work with. Um, and what we've seen is that you know if we can develop products that consolidate some of these data sets together, we can derive a lot more value for uh, an end customer, especially again you know from a perspective of mining. Let's say you have you know, a chemical map that you're looking to make with hyperspectral imagery, but then you also overlay that with, uh, you know, a D, uh, you know, an elevation model that you derive from uh, one of these radar satellites. Now you know exactly, you know, where you must start drilling to find a very specific type of ore based on the chemical survey, and that's just a lot more valuable information to a geologist and a lot more valuable for them, you know, from a one stop shop. And that just drives value for everybody. Right. So going back to my point where it's like, you know, we don't think it's a winner take all. We think it's everybody can be winners as long as we sort of work together and uh, towards that uh, singular goal. And so that's how we sort of do that um, for OTRX specifically. Uh, it is a sensor on another partner satellite. 
we are going to be revealing, revealing that partner uh, because we're working with them a lot more longer term in the coming months ish. Um, but yeah, uh, we're basically using the sensor that's currently up there operating. Um, so that is visual to near infrared. So we've been able to capture a lot of imagery for a lot of our agricultural customers. So we've been able to win a few contracts there. Uh, we're working with a few science agencies and a few other oil and gas and mining customers as well. Um, so we are driving quite a lot of that. But then again, we're also gathering a lot more imagery from, again, not just ours, but from other people's satellites as well, uh, making you know full uh, integrated data products that our customers have been uh, loving quite a bit. Um, so yeah, we're not just looking to be just data. We're looking to derive a lot more intelligence and be, yeah. uh, I think we're, we see ourselves becoming a lot more vertically focused within the mining and resources sector. Um, just because, yeah, it's uh, where we think that we can drive a lot of the value uh, uh, with the imagery and just the scale that we can deliver on. Okay, great. I, I confess I was yeah, looking for some breaking news there, um, but we'll mm -hmm. have to keep our ears out uh, and eyes out. Same, okay. Same. <laughs> no problem. Um, also great to hear the mention of radar. Um, we've had Umbra on the show as well. Um, that does seem like a hot new, um, I guess, niche or sub niche of the yeah, Earth observation market. Cool. So it seems you facilitate natural resource exploration from space with examples about methane, lithium, carbon and iron on your website. Um, plus the many other applications you've mentioned already. So how would a customer use your imagery to search for lithium deposits and why is your product better? Yeah, great question. And sorry, um, can I just attach? So you mentioned your medium resolution and Wyvern is high resolution. So what's your uh, cell size? Uh, I think we're about 10 meters. Okay. Uh, I think Wyvern's closer to five. Yeah, five uh, they're five. working a lot. Yeah, they're working on a lot more higher res stuff as well. Um, and sometimes that's the difference, right? Like their double R resolution. So that, uh, you know, meshes pretty well with our spectral uh, density. Um, yeah, with uh, the. Uh, lithium. With, uh, with lithium, right? So we have been doing quite a lot of surveys, and we actually had quite a little bit of success uh, across a few customers where we did, where we did some proof of concept, um, where we were using a lot of imagery from Nmap, but then also some other uh, hyperspectral satellites as well, and running our own analysis on top of that. Um, so we're specifically looking for uh, either spodamine or lepidolite deposits. Um, we've had a, real, a lot of good pre uh, performance with lepidolite uh, uh, deposits. We're trying to get better with spodamine Is that ones. Lepidolite. Yes, so okay. there's uh, yeah the two um, or two of the uh, ore deposits that you can find for lithium, um, and uh, those are some of the ones that we're currently looking at. Um, and yeah, uh, we've been able to find a few of those and traces of those for some of our customers and group concepts, um, which has then been ground treated. So a lot of that has honestly been more on the software end, where we've you know built our own algorithms to be able to identify a lot of these minerals. Um, sometimes they're obviously hidden under vegetation. There's a lot of on the ground topography things that can interfere with, you know, signals of a lot of these ores or clay deposits that can be, you know, traces of these type of ores. Um, so we've been able to do quite a lot of work to eliminate that and, you know, whether it be spectral and mixing or other types of methods uh, where we derive a lot of that uh, intelligence, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so far with our proof of concepts, we've been doing a lot of validation where it's like, we already know something's there, we are to find it. And then we're like, oh, did we find it or not? Yes or no. And that's basically been a really good feedback loop that we've had with some of our customers where they've been like, yep, you guys found exactly what we thought you would. Uh, and that's been a lot of great validation for us. Fascinating. So uh, you're Ooh, also fun. offering some analytics service then? You have a data science yeah. team? We do. Um, so we have a platform called Earth Tones. Um, so Earth Tones is sort of the end all be all for us at the moment. So with that's uh, it's not exactly, let's say, you know, an analytics platform, then it is an analytics engine, uh, uh, I guess. Um, but that I'm sort of mean by that is like we've taken a little bit of a different approach where we're, you know, uh, we're, I don't want to build another UI UX. I don't want to, I don't want to build another ArcGIS, right? Uh, we don't want our customers to learn completely not another tech stack to be able to use Thank it. Thank you. What, Thank you. Like, <laughs> we don't, it's a huge problem. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Right. So what we really realized is like, you know, what if we can just obscure the intelligence in the sense that um you know if we have we're working with a customer and you know they're a geologist they're very used to looking at pdf reports and geotechnical reports why don't we just use all the data that we can hyperspectral sar radar all these other things 
generate a similar report just so they can easily understand it. So it's, you know, whether it's auto generated or not. Similarly, for some oil and gas customers where we're looking at methane, for example, they don't need to, you know, learn another platform or log on and be like, okay, where, where are there uh, pipeline leakages? You know, the easiest way is for a field operator to get a text on their phone being like, XYZ coordinates, go and check out, there's possibly a leak. They don't need to know how it's detected. Um, and in a way, it's like what we think is the best application or the best way of deploying our analytics, at least, is when the customer doesn't even know it's Earth observation data. Uh, they, it's just, you know, powering on the ground, uh, you know, efficiencies. And they're just like, hey, here's an auto-generated report for our today's quota of drill holes, for example. You know, that's a lot more valuable uh, and a lot more easily integratable with existing practices where it's like, you know, we don't, we're, we, we're not asking any of our mining customers to completely scrap their exploration practices. We just want to be another uh, layer of value add um, and, uh, you know, drive uh, a lot of impact from there uh, instead of, you know, being completely a new platform. Okay. So uh, what's on my mind now is that you, as you've mentioned the word intelligence, but you are now a market intelligence company. I've had uh, Synmax and SkyFi on, both started by a billionaire energy trader, Bill Perkins. I don't know why, but he wanted to connect with me on LinkedIn. He, we've also had a bit of banter on Twitter uh, before I yeah. left. Why is he interesting? Well, he posted in the past month about using SkyFire to go and check uh, wellpad activity, which is important for him as an energy trader because that's sort of a proxy for um, a possible increase in supply um, of, of a commodity. Mm -hmm. So you just mentioned a bunch of examples that would be of interest to someone like him. I can't help but feel that companies like you have an advantage over us all. If, and I'm not accusing you, I'm just saying it's a fact, like you guys have signals before everyone else. That is that is completely true. Uh, and they, we've actually, uh, this is us, me just being honest, right? Uh, we've actually been working with a few companies who are looking to derive, use our imagery to derive more market intelligence for, you know, Fortune 500 companies and hedge fund traders and whatnot. Um, now, the thing there is, though, right, we're not, uh, let's say, a government satellite. Anybody can buy our imagery. And at the rate that Esper is selling at, you know, a dollar fifty per square kilometer, that just mm. reduces the barrier to entry by a lot, All right? So in a sense, now this wasn't something that we intended to do, but it's a result of us really, you know, being obsessed with the customer problem, at least in the exploration space, that has driven down the pricing of a lot of our imagery, and we just wanted to be as easily as accessible to, uh, but any customer. What that's done is that's opened it up in. I don't want to use the word data democratization because it's Thank like I, I feel like a lot of people have said that and not really delivered on it. I don't. I don't want to be another name on that list. Um, so it's, it's also just such a cliche term. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Um, but I guess what we've done is from a commercial aspect, it's like. Um, if you've got, you know, a dollar fifteen in your pocket, you could probably get a square kilometer worth of imagery. Uh, it's up right. to you to know where that might be. So you saying the analytics score. on top? Sorry to cut cut right. over. So is do the analytics on top come with with that dollar fifty? No, those are a lot more special. Like it's more like a white glove service that we are currently offering through Earthtones. However, again, uh, it's like uh, the way we're we're still planning how to price that out. Uh, it's we're looking that's looking a lot more closer to be instead of a flat data rate pricing, it's looking a lot more closer to be let's say a value based pricing. Where again, you know, if we're you know helping somebody find a you know a billion dollar worth of ore, that's you know, the how thing much is our for dollar fifty probably. <laughs> okay, cool. Amazing. That's right. I also can't help but think because, like, I think Bill Perkins' company, like he, because of all the turmoil in Europe, he moved the headquarters of Skylark Capital actually to London, I believe. Um, and it's it's a, as I understand, it's a sort of multi billion dollar operation, and must be many of these energy trading firms. If and I don't mean this as any sort of an insult, but if it was only a million dollars and you've already got um, a market intelligence capability, I can't help but think that a lot of these companies must have their own constellations. I think that they're it's... not telling anyone about. 
nothing that we've heard of, honestly. Like, right. or maybe in a way, um, so a lot of these market intelligence firms are some of the highest paying commercial customers uh, for a lot of EO companies like ours. Um, we've, all, we've all seen statistics where, you know, defense and, uh, you know, intelligence services are probably the biggest buyers. And at the moment, they are going to be a very big chunk of the market. What we've seen is right after them, that's where a lot of these market intelligence firms really come in, whether it be from a perspective of, um, being more trader focused, let's say, you know, being having that information as just if you're a hedge fund or something like that, or on the other end, which you could still count as a market intelligence service when you're trying to help, um, you know, farmer increase their yield or, you know, a yeah. mining company find new mines in a way that's more, instead of trading the stock, they're trading some other commodity here. Yeah. Um, so it's still, you know, very much on top uh, where we, I guess in some sense, we still consider them all market intelligence where uh, it's in a way, People want all of that data to be available uh, to them. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then, what if anything your customers saying about their AI needs as our second last question? Yeah, I think we've. So we work in a lot of industries that are still very manual. Like people don't think they are, but they are. Right, like uh, you know, geologists still need to go on the ground. They still need to look at the rocks, read the rocks, as they say, uh, look at how the formations are to actually get a feel of you know whether what type of field there might be, or why there is something where there is. And we're just trying to be another layer of data. We're actually helping that process be a lot more efficient. Um, we haven't seen a huge drive for somebody telling us it's like, hey, can you automate this process A to Z? Um, because when it comes to mining, at least, it's a lot, it's very hard to do. Um, there are great companies like EarthAI, for example, like uh, we really like what their team is doing with, you know, not, uh, they're using so many different types of data sets, drilling hole, drill holes and whatnot, and they've been able to really drive a lot of that processing and they've been able to get a really good, uh, uh, you know, mineral uh, deposits and they have this entire new um, uh, 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 link. You know, they've been posting a lot of video content on LinkedIn that I've just been glued <laughs> to, and I think they've been driving. They've been driving quite a lot of that uh, processes there, as well as like Fleet, uh, for example. They've also been doing a lot of AI-based processing on more subsurface level imaging using their geodes. Um, so I think it's like getting there quite a bit. In remote sensing, we've seen AI always play a very big role. Um, uh, now AI has probably become a bit of a buzzword, whereas, you know, for us, machine learning's obviously been a lot more before any type yeah. of classification of that industry data, right? The first yeah. thing you do is, you know, the, the, uh, you know, unsupervised or sort of learnings based, based on that, if you're looking at a new area or looking at anomalies or whatever, and that's been, you know, industry standard for a while. And I think the new way uh, of, of, of AI is definitely pushing a lot of that to be more user-friendly in some sense. Um, where we've seen a lot of companies be able to turn that into a more text-based thing, where it's like, you know, if it's literally a prompt where it could be like, hey, no, you know, a, a, you know, see Find the lithium. <laughs> exactly, right? And, and then it itself knows to go out and do that. And I think we're we're getting very close to that feature. Have I seen a customer request that from us? Not yet. Um, but then it could also be, you know, the case where it's like, you know, Henry Ford has a great saying, right? Where it's like, if I ask people what they want, they'd say they want a faster horse instead of yes. a car, right? Uh, it, it could definitely be that case. Um, for us, it's more about wait and see. We wait on hearing what our customers want, and then we go and build it. Um, does that mean we're a little behind the curve sometimes? Definitely. But that means that we're building something that our customers really want, and we're not building something for the sake of building it or because there's hype behind it. Yep, that's a really wise response. Thanks, Shoaib. Okay, so last of all, if you were hiring an apprentice, what qualities are you looking for? Great question. Um, let's say for me personally, uh, it's uh, my roles change so much in the company itself. Uh, I remember when I used to do a lot of more technical work at the start of the company. Now I barely get to see uh, anything more technical than a spreadsheet. Um, it's I think uh, in EO, it's even if you're, let's say, more of a business person, you, you know, you're not really a technical person, you still need some sort of technical chops, uh, being able to really understand what the customer needs, because at the end of the day, a lot of these problems that we're solving for our customers are eventually science problems. Um, everything is, you know, running on the scientific method of like going out, you know, testing, proving, getting inferences and sort of doing that iteration over and over again. 
uh, starting from hypothesis that you have. Uh, so it's very much, uh, even the business development side is very much a scientist game. Um, and I think in a way it's good because uh, the, again, it's so technical where it's like, we don't want to, like, at least at Esper, we don't want to be snake oil salesmen. Right? We want to know that if we're selling a product to a customer, that it's grounded in reality and would res whether even if it's like us, uh, like, I don't want to even or exaggerate any of our resolutions because that can definitely mean a yes or a no for a certain customer. And if that means, you know, if I'm getting a yes from a customer by telling them, oh, I actually have five meter GSC instead of 10, um, uh, that just means that I'm selling something that I can't actually deliver on. And we've seen that way too much in the industry and we don't want to be one of those uh, books again. So that's why like being very much grounded in science is probably something that I'd ask of like an apprentice of mine, where if I'm teaching them to you know fill in my shoes eventually, and that's just how we've as a company been very much approaching a lot of our sales cycles too. Yeah, again, this is a really wonderful message. So uh, yeah, Shweb, this has been a fast paced but broad um, overview of some really interesting themes in our industry. Um, I was thinking how to sum it up, maybe it's a bit cheeky, um, but it sounds like what you're telling us is that you can do geotech boreholes or at least have outcomes similar uh, to those, but from space. We're trying to really work up to that quality and be able to deliver similar outcomes. Uh, we're not a complete replacement to them uh, or to any other exploration methodology. We're trying to be a more value add to make everything a lot more efficient. Uh, and we think we've been uh, we've been delivering so far for a lot of our existing customers, and we want to be scaling that further up. Fantastic, Shweb. Thanks for coming on. Thanks a lot for having me.